Hello, North Park. My name is Brett Fleeser, one of the worship leaders here, and I'm very excited to be able to worship with you all. Uh, we have a great team here, some great friends, and we're just excited to be able to do this. It's been a long time since we've been in the sanctuary, and uh, we're glad that God has not changed, and he's good today, yesterday, and forever. So I'm going to open up with a scripture, and uh, would you join in as I read? The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our Lord? The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock, exalted be my God, the rock, my savior, therefore I will praise you. Lord, among the nations, I will sing the praises of your name. That was 2 Samuel 22, 2, 3. Would you join us as we worship? Come, let us worship. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your spirit, awaken the life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great
Stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. You never stop.
could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence, and I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. Just sit and wait for all your goodness. Hope to feel your presence. And I could just stay. I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something Go away, you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go away, you will lead me, Lord. Where you will lead me, Lord. Oh, you will lead me, Lord. Let's sing, I could hold on.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to North Park Church's online service. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Now, I don't know about you, but this past week for me, it took me into a lot of uncertainty. Some of the events that went on in the week uh, with the COVID virus hitting the second wave, I just found myself surrounded with this idea of uncertainty. A couple of weeks ago, one of our elders in our elder meeting led this devotion on uncertainty. And just a reminder that God is sure. God is there for us. In the midst of some of these thoughts, maybe perhaps you're feeling the same way, I came across a prayer, a prayer for those uncertain times. And so that's what I want to open with. I'm going to pray this prayer. Would you join me as we pray? Dear God, life is crazy right now with this global pandemic and all that's going on in the world, and we have no idea what lies ahead. Everything is changing, our routines are changing, work is changing, our activities are changing. What was once familiar is fading, and we're being led into a season of uncertainty. Please help us not to fear change, but rather know that you are with us, and you'll work all of these changes for our good, and you'll even bring glory to your name. Thank you for being such a good father and always knowing what's best. Thanks for your promise to lead us to peaceful waters, even in this valley of uncertainty. Help us to tune out all the distractions and instead to focus on your still small voice during this season so that we can follow you moment by moment to those restful places where we can experience your peace and find relief from our anxious thoughts. Thank you that despite all the uncertainty that surrounds us, you are faithful and true, and you are in control. Help us to trust an uncertain future into your strong and your loving hands. Yes, help us to trust us with, to trust you with all of our hearts and not be afraid. And mostly, help us to remain hopeful and reassured while we wait on you that one day you will eradicate all disease and all viruses. One day you will renew all relationships and one day you will restore joy to our world. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. That's the hope that we have in an uncertain world. Listen, just a couple of announcements, just to highlight during this time. First of all, this is Thanksgiving week that we're going into, uh, leading up to Thanksgiving weekend next weekend. So I want to encourage you with this whole attitude of gratitude and the ways that we can look and invite God to help us to see maybe needs in our community, and we can try and meet some of those needs. Uh, At North Park next week, we're actually having a bit of a food campaign or a a food drive for um, my sister's place. It's an organization that we've been in partnership with throughout the summer, and they've informed us they have a few needs, so we want to provide opportunities for you. So next week, between Monday and Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., there'll be tables outside North Park, and we're asking for those grab, uh, those grab a snack things, easy to grab snacks, uh, even pudding cups or fruit cups, and they're also in need of things like shampoo and conditioner and, and deodorant. So those things you can bring in. But you know what? We also want you to think just beyond North Park Church and some of our partnerships. This next week, why not consider ways that you can maybe give to the London Food Bank? I know they annually have their Thanksgiving food drive. Uh, This year they're going to do it virtually, so encourage you. Go on their website and consider how maybe you can give a a monetary donation just to help those in need in our community. Or look for other ways. Ask God to open your eyes to other ways that you can help and and serve uh, this Thanksgiving season. Uh, Some highlights. Uh, You all get our e-news Twice a week we send out this e-news that is filled with announcements and things going on around North Park. One thing specifically I want to highlight that's coming up on Tuesday, October 6th, and that is our on-site prayer gathering. Now what we've seen throughout this whole COVID season is we've seen opportunities for prayer really take off, and many of you are responding. Our online prayer times throughout this season have been maxed out. We've had 50 some odd people that have just been part of praying for North Park and praying for our church and our community. And so on Tuesday, October 6th, we're actually going to be on site for prayer. So go to the North Park register and register for that time. We'd love to have you come and join us with that. We're in the midst of just finishing up a message series that we've started in September, but I want to jump ahead to two weekends. In two weekends from now, on October 18th, we are launching a new message series that's entitled Ethos, Our Church, Our Culture, and Our Community. And in that series, what we're doing is we're looking at our six core values, um, what it is that motivates what we do and shapes who we are. 
And the unique thing about this series, and I'm really excited about this, we're actually going to involve all of our campuses. So Fanshawe, Huron, and Stratford are all going to be involved in this teaching series. The teaching pastors, myself, Shane, and Kirk, we're all going to be preaching the messages. And one week you may have the video service from Fanshawe, one week it may be at Huron, and one week it may be at Stratford. And in each of those weeks, you're actually going to see the people and the worship teams at each of those sites. What a wonderful time we have to all join together as a broader church community and just see the unity that we have. So join us October 8th, we launch that series. In a few moments, Matt Loveday is going to come and continue in the series, as I said, that we started in September. It's entitled, We Believe, Exploring Our Statement of Faith. And today, Matt is going to look at the idea and the significance of the church and the Bible to our lives and what we believe about them. So will you join me as we welcome Matt to come and share today? Well, many of you will know the story of the ugly duckling. It's a heartbreaking yet beautiful story of a young swan that hatches mysteriously into the wrong nest, a nest full of ducks. And it isn't too long before the ugly duckling realizes that it is not like those around it. And it does not belong. And so the ugly duckling embarks on an unsuccessful journey to find acceptance and love in the presence of others. Only each and every time the ugly duckling is rejected, left on the outside, looking in. Until at last the ugly duckling is found by a family of swans, bringing the realization that it is not a duck at all. But it is, and always has been, in fact, a beautiful swan. And so the story ends with the joy and the happiness that finding a place to belong, being accepted and loved, can bring. Now, the Ugly Duckling is a story about being different. It's a story about identity, but ultimately it's a story about finding a place of belonging and finding a family. It was first written in 1843 by Danish poet and author Hans Christian Andersen. And the story of the Ugly Duckling has been adapted and retold ever since in many different formats, including Walt Disney's own award-winning short film produced in color for the very first time in 1939. Now, what is it about this simple story that we connect to? Well, I believe we connect with the story because it defines for us a common struggle that we all know. It's the struggle that we have between our individuality and a sense of community. You see, all of us at one point or another have felt like the ugly duckling, haven't we? On the outside, looking in, just wanting to find a, a place to belong and to fit in. In society, and especially in the West, our individualism, well, it's highly valued. We talk about our individual rights and freedoms a lot. We talk about our own autonomy and the ability that we have to make our own decisions for ourselves. We value self-expression and being able to dress and act and look the way that we want. And you see, being an individual is certainly important and it is wonderful. And yet it can be hard to be an individual and also find a place within community. I mean, I just need to think of my own family. My wife, Christine, and I have three boys, and we are each unique and different individuals. And while we love each other deeply, when it comes time just to do something as simple as choosing what to watch uh, on Netflix or what to have for dinner, it always doesn't go so well. We, someone can be left in tears because we are all so different. You see, this is the tension of family. This is the tension of community. This is the tension of togetherness, to be a collection of unique individuals where there is still room for our individualism to breathe, but where we live, work, and play together with others in unity and with a sense of belonging. Now, we are into week four of our fall sermon series called We Believe, where we've been talking about our statement of faith as a church and it's these two small letters, the W and the E, that makes the big difference. 
Yes, I mean, in, in one sense, every individual makes a choice to believe on their own, but this sermon series isn't entitled, I Believe. It's called, We Believe, because our statement of faith identifies for us core beliefs that we all hold and that we all share, understanding that in community, we must leave room for our uh, individual identities, but we also must know the place of our commonality. So in this past year, our statement of faith was reviewed by members of our staff, our elders, and our congregation, and then it was presented to the elders and ultimately presented before the congregation for approval. And many, many thanks are owed to those individuals who spent many hours talking and packaging this up so nicely for us. And so far in our sermon series, we have examined the first six statements of faith. So by way of review, let me just read them for us, starting with the preamble. North Park is a non-denominational Christian church. With the whole church, we affirm the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed as foundational summaries of the Christian faith. We believe there is one true God, the creator and stainer of all that is, who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's original creation was perfect, but the first humans sinned against God by willful disobedience and passed on a corrupted nature to all humanity. Our sin alienates us from God and brings us under his condemnation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God's only Son, was born of the Virgin Mary, is truly divine and truly human, yet is without sin. Jesus died in our place, reconciling sinful humanity to, him, to God and offering salvation as a gift received by faith. Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is the mediator between humanity and God the Father. The Holy Spirit, who is the eternal Spirit of God, leads people to repentance, lives in them, and is transforming them to be more like Jesus. Now, these statements of faith that we have looked at so far, they accurately describe our understanding of God as our creator and as our redeemer. They also help us define who we are and give us a deeper understanding of ourselves created in the image of God and yet separated from God because of sin, but offered forgiveness and redemption through the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, today we are going to be focusing on statements 7 and 8, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea that we've already begun to discuss about belonging, about finding a way to embrace our individualism and also embracing our togetherness as a community of faith. Statement 7 says this, The church is made up of all believers who are adopted into the family of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to worship God, build one another up, share the gospel, and promote justice and love in the world. Now notice in our statement that we use a capital C when we talk about the church. It's what we sometimes refer to as the big C church. Now this capitalization is not a symbol of superiority, but rather of unity and of togetherness you see, we can understand our view of the Big C Church by maybe looking at some of the language we often use to describe church. You see, often we can talk about our local church. We can talk about North Park Community Church, this place where we attend, where we serve, where we grow in faith and in relationship with others. But we can also talk about the global church. You see, North Park certainly is not even the only church in London, let alone in Ontario or Canada or the entire world. The global church expands our understanding of the church further. And then there is the universal church, which spans not just the globe, but also time. And this is what we mean by the Big C Church, the whole people of God. And this big C church, this church universal, is made up of all believers, our statement says. All believers. Now, this refers back to our statements of faith about what we believe about Jesus, God's only Son who died in our place and who offers us salvation through faith. 
You see, the church is made up of believers, people who place their hope and their trust in Jesus. The Greek word that is used in the New Testament that we often translate into the church is the word ecclesia, and it is never used to refer to a building or a particular place. Instead, it always refers to a people. And here's the thing that we always must remember and understand about the big C church, that being made up of all believers, it is always more inclusive than exclusive. You see, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Let me make that perfectly clear. Being more inclusive doesn't mean that there are many ways to salvation. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. And Jesus is the only life. But Jesus' arms are wide open in acceptance. You know, from the early days of the church, this was wrestled with and yet confirmed time and time again. And John 3.16 always seems to say it best. For God so loved the world. Very inclusive language. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. There's the exclusive language. It's just through Jesus Christ. But through Jesus Christ, anyone, there is that um, inclusive language, anyone who believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the church is made up of all believers in Jesus Christ, who are then adopted into God's family. And I love this. We, we said that we often use the word ecclesia, or the word ecclesia is used in the New Testament when describing um, the people of God. But the Bible also uses many metaphors to describe the people of God. And one of the most common and perhaps the most powerful that we can relate to is this idea of the family of God. And I want us to notice this about the family of God, that we are all adopted into it. It's not like some of us are already in while others are out trying to get in. No, no, no. We are all on the outside looking to get in because sin has separated us from God. But through belief in Jesus Christ, we are adopted into God's family. John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 say it this way, But to all who believed him, that's Jesus, and accepted him, again, that's Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You see, The Ugly Duckling is a great story of discovering true identity and finding acceptance as a swan who comes to know that he is a swan. But the ugly side of the ugly duckling story is this, that the swan is rejected time and time again by other kinds of birds. You see, this whole idea of adoption is this idea of the inclusion of the other, not the exclusion of the other. And each and every one of us is a sinner, an outcast, an outsider. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we are brought in and we are adopted into the family of God. And when we choose to believe, we choose to embrace this invitation of God in Jesus Christ. We are never cast aside or rejected, but rather we are adopted into the family of God and given a place to belong, no matter how different we may be. Now let me take a moment to tell you a story that has always spoken to my heart about this idea of acceptance and belonging. When I was in my uh, late 20s, I got my motorcycle license. And I had ridden a small dirt bike when I was a young boy uh, every now and again, but it had been many years since I'd been on a motorcycle. And so I um, writ wrote my test and I got my license and I went down to Holly Gully here in South London, and I bought myself a motorcycle, a 500cc Kawasaki Vulcan. And as I had my friend bring me down to pick my bike up so that I could drive it home for the very first time, I began to feel really nervous because I began to realize that it had been so many years since I'd been on a bike, and at that, I was smaller, and the bike was smaller, and here I was about to just go out on the open road on a bike that I had never ridden before. And so I remember doing some practice circles in the parking lot just so that I could remember how to ride again. And I'll admit I was terrified. 
Finally, I got up the courage to hit the busy streets of London, and so out I turned onto the road at a nice slow pace. My knuckles were white from holding on so tight. My muscles were tense from just trying to stay upright and not fall over and crash. And about two minutes into my ride, I saw some other motorcyclists riding towards me. And as they passed, they did the most amazing thing. They lowered their hand and gave me a little wave, a wave of acceptance. Now, they must have thought that I was pretty rude because there was no way I was letting go of those handlebars. I did not wave back. But I remember the thoughts going through my mind. I certainly didn't know who these motorcyclists were and they didn't know who I was. They certainly didn't know that I had literally only been on my motorcycle for less than five minutes. And yet they welcomed me and accepted me because I was on a bike. And that was it. I was a biker simply because I was on a bike. If you are a biker, you know what I mean. You get the wave. A simple but powerful gesture of acceptance. And when we are adopted into the family of God, we are given a place to belong immediately. A place where we are accepted, not for what we have done, or for how well we have done it, or for how long we have been doing it, but because in the family of God we all share a common belief in Jesus Christ. And because we are believed, we are accepted, and we are adopted, we are in, we belong to the big C church. But we aren't just given a place to belong in the family of God, we are also given great purpose. As our statement of faith number seven finishes off by saying that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do four things. Let's look at them quickly together. One is to worship God. Two is to build one another up. Three, share the gospel. And four, promote justice and love in the world. Now again, let's remember that this empowerment of the Holy Spirit and these four purposes are for all believers. All believers who are all adopted and who are all empowered to live a life of purpose. And I emphasize the word all because we can sometimes get stuck in our understanding of church as just being a place of belonging. And there is no doubt that it is absolutely that. But it is also much more than that. The church, the family of God, is a place of purpose, a people of purpose. And I just want to quickly touch on these four purposes in our statement of faith. One is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to worship God. Now we worship God in all different sorts of ways. And we worship God not because of our circumstances, but we worship God because our worship is God-centered and God-driven. Now what exactly do I mean by that? Well, I mean that no matter what it is that we face in life, we can always worship God. I mean, life can be hard, right? It can be full of heartache, it can be full of uncertainty and difficulty. We've all experienced that in the last six months alone as our world has been deeply impacted by COVID-19. And yet, we can still worship God together. We can still worship God for who He is, for all He has done, and proclaim together that God is still good, that God is still in control, and that God's ever-faithful, ever-loving presence is with us through it all. You see, Holy Spirit-empowered worship is not dependent on circumstance. It is driven by our thanks and praise to God that we express in all seasons and all times of life. Now, secondly, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to build one another up. We support one another, we encourage one another, we inspire one another, we pray for one another, just as our mission says, to inspire, support, and mobilize one another to live more like Jesus so that we can be a life-giving and transforming presence in our families, community, and in our world. And like our worship of God, we do this in many ways, big and small. And during this pandemic, we have continued to build one another up. And I just want to share one quick story from our kids' ministry from the past number of months. It was in this summer that we had 50 kids in grades 1 to 5 sign up to be secret agents with a challenge specifically to live out in practical ways our mission statement. 
One of their tasks was to make a picture or maybe a card and simply send it to someone in our church family that might be feeling a bit lonely or isolated and need a little bit of cheering up. It was a beautiful and a simple way for one person to encourage another person to build them up. You see, Holy Spirit-empowered encouragement doesn't come from only a few people in the church. It should come from all of us, each and every one of us, irregardless of our age, reaching out to one another and building each other up. This is what we do for each other as the church. Third, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. Now, this is what we talk uh, about when we say evangelism. And some of us can be scared off by the word evangelism, but really, it's simply speaking out our story of faith in Jesus to others as opportunity arises. And we do this through word, but also through deed. This is why purposes three and four go really well together. We share the gospel and we proclaim justice and love in the world. Again, let me use a practical example from these past six months. Many times over the last number of months, we have collected water bottles, Gatorade bottles, granola bars, freezies. We've baked cookies, we've made muffins, and we've brought them in and donated them to places like Sanctuary or Arcade or my sister's place. We've taken a good chunk of money and we've given it to Lord Elgin School to help build a playground, a playground that kids are enjoying this fall as they head back to school. You see, we have shown the love of Jesus to others in deeply practical and powerful ways. Together, we share Jesus with the world. We use our words to tell others our own story of hope that we have found in Jesus Christ. And we use our actions to promote justice and to display the love of God in our everyday living. You see, the church is made up of all believers who are adopted into the family of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to worship God, build one another up, share the gospel, and promote justice and love in the world. We are a bunch of unique individuals who are adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ to find belonging and purpose together in the family of God, in the church. And as the church, we also believe in the authority of the Bible. So let's spend a little bit of time with statement number eight, which says this, We believe the writings of the Old and New Testaments comprise the divinely inspired, fully trustworthy, supreme and sufficient authority in all matters of faith and conduct. You see, the Bible is a lot more than the best-selling book of all time. It's more than a good book. It's more than the good book. Now, over the years, you maybe have heard the Bible described in one of these following ways. It is God's love letter to the world. It is God's owner's manual for life. It is God's roadmap that guides us through life. And each of these is all true, but the Bible is more than that. The Bible is actually a library. It's composed of 66 different books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And these 66 books are then authored over hundreds of years by dozens of different authors and comprised in many different styles and genres of writing, including books of history, books of prophecy, and books of wisdom. And just as the many individuals are brought together to make up the church and the family of God, in the same way, many individual authors of the Bible and their contributions are brought together under the inspiration of God. You know, so much could be said about the composition of the Bible, and there is just such a rich history in how the Bible, this amazing story of God's deep love for us, has gotten into our hands to read in the Bible. Now, we certainly can't cover it all today, but we want to cover here are at least the three main statements that we believe about the Bible. The first is this. It is divinely inspired, okay? And by this, we mean that God has always been able to control the narrative. It is God's story. And God led and directed men and women to author the Bible and to each play a part in the telling of God's story. God has always controlled 
the narrative. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Now, the truth is, is that questions are always going to arise about how to interpret certain passages of the Bible. But we are never going to question the fact that God has in fact spoken. You see, in this way, we will always hold divine inspiration over human interpretation. The reality is that our understanding of truth is always assisted by God's Spirit, who reveals to us a deeper understanding. You know, I had a, a professor in seminary who always had a saying that he kept repeating to us in class over and over again. And he said, it's not about how many times you have been through the Bible. It's about how many times the Bible has been through you. And this statement always reminded me and everyone else in my class that just as God played this important part in the inspiration of the Scripture, God also plays the important part of helping us to interpret so that we continue to allow God to lead us into an understanding of truth and to realize that God is still speaking to us through the Bible. Secondly, the Bible is trustworthy. Now, this means that we don't have to understand every single thing about the Bible in order to understand God's deep, deep love for us. You know, something can be trustworthy. It doesn't mean that we understand everything about it. It just means that we know it to be trustworthy. Take, for example, um, flying on air in airplanes. Remember when we used to do that? Now, think about that, right? Heavy pieces of metal with dozens of people on board seemingly floating and soaring through the air. How is this possible? Now, sure, you can study velocity, you can study thrust, and you can study air pressure, but you don't have to in order to trust that an airplane will fly. What you can do is you can just see one in the sky, or maybe you've ridden in one yourself. Now, don't mishear me on this. I'm not saying that we don't then need to study the Bible deeply. In fact, I'm saying just the opposite. We do need to study the Bible, and we do need to dig deep into God's Word. There's always more that we can learn about who God is and how He wants us to live in the world. But there will always be some things, and we must understand this, there will always be th some things that we just won't ever get the answers for. But this doesn't mean that we can't trust God's Word. The Bible is fully trustworthy. And that leads me to the third truth that we believe about the Bible, that it has supreme and sufficient authority in all matters of life and conduct. Once again, this kind of signifies to us this reality that the Bible won't reveal to us everything, but it will reveal to us enough. Uh, a number of years ago, I traveled abroad, and, and I found myself in a foreign city surrounded by people who spoke a different language than I did, and I couldn't understand. And it was days, this was the days before smartphones or, or GPS or Google Translate, and, and all I had with me was a piece of paper with some simple instructions on how to find the place where I was going to spend the night at the youth hostel. And what I thought beforehand were pretty clear instructions on the paper, when I was standing there on the street corner, unable to read any of the signs around me, and unable to communicate clear with, with, clearly with anyone who could help me, I started to feel very disoriented, feeling like I was lost and that I couldn't find my way in where I was going. And yet, as I reached out for a little bit of help and as I put some hard work into it, and as through some broken English I got a little bit more information, I was able to find out where I was going and able to find my place of lodging for the night. Now, I say this because it would be really nice and it's always easier to have all of the information laid out for us, right? Take two steps forward, turn left. Take another three steps, turn right. But this isn't the way the information is always given to us by God. We don't always have everything given to us in the Bible, but we certainly have enough. The Bible reveals enough for us to get to where God is leading us. With a little bit of hard work and a little bit of help, and a little bit of trust in God's leading. 
you know, as a community of unique individuals in different stages of life and with different experiences of life, the Bible is God's word that always leads each and every one of us forward in faith. It's why in our preschool ministry we teach from the Bible. In our kids' ministry we teach from the Bible. In our youth ministry we teach from the Bible. At our ESL program we teach from the Bible. In our small groups we teach from the Bible. At North Park Huron, at North Park Stratford, and at North Park Fanshawe we teach from, you guessed it, the Bible. And we do this because we believe the writings of the Old and New Testaments uh, comprise the divinely inspired, fully trustworthy, supreme and sufficient authority in all matters of faith and conduct. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am aware that at this specific moment in time, I am in an empty auditorium speaking to a camera. But God, you are here with me in this moment, just as you are with each and every one who watches this message, no matter where they're watching it from. We are never, ever alone. Your presence and your people reach far beyond one singular place and one particular time. We are your church. We believe in you. And in our common belief in you and our faith placed in Jesus Christ, we find belonging and acceptance. And we also find purpose, to, uh, the purpose to worship you, to build one another up, to share this message of lo the love of Jesus with those around us. And in this gift of the Bible that we have, we find the wisdom and the knowledge of your deep love that leads us ever forward in life, regardless, regardless of its circumstances. God, we ask that in our differences, may we learn to see beautiful expressions of your grace and acceptance. As individuals, may we find our unity by being found in you. And for our everyday living, may your Holy Spirit lead us to live together with deep meaning and divine purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us close our time together by reading statements 7 and 8 together. Would you read along with me? We believe the church is made up of all believers who are adopted into the family of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to worship God build one another up, share the gospel, and promote justice and love in the world. The writings of the Old and New Testaments comprise the divinely inspired, fully trustworthy, supreme and sufficient authority in all matters of faith and conduct. North Park Community Church, this is what we believe. All right, would you please join us as we close off our service?
gave us his one and only son to save us for God so Well, thank you so much for joining in. Would you be blessed and God bless this uh, weekend? Go in peace. I was supposed to look over there. My bad, everybody. Love you.